the last couple of weeks, I've been talking about how um, it's the, the grit of getting in there and, and doing the exhausting work of um, helping your neighbors and, and really the cycle that we've been talking about now for, for a couple of years of loving your neighbors, loving God, and serving others who are in need. Um, that's what's going to win the day with the church. Um, I, I just saw another recent article about um, Hillsong, which I mentioned last week. Hillsong Church, which uh, has really marketed itself with all, all these Christian songs that we hear, and, and, and their music is fantastic. Uh, but this article was asking Christians to stop promoting their music um, just because there's so much immorality uh, that goes on within that church and so much, uh, so much abuse. And they said, like, they don't really, Hillsong doesn't really stand for kingdom living. They don't, they don't really work to improve the lives of people who are in need. Um, it's, it's a big money-making machine. And, and there are exceptions. I mean, certainly there, there are lives that have been touched. There are lives that have been, uh, that have been improved. Um, but that's not really their mission. Um, and, and, and so a lot of those big mega churches are, are crumbling at, at record paces. Uh, and the statistics show that. You know, start, church statisticians are showing uh, that some of, the, some of the least healthy churches are these big mega churches uh, that have the deep pockets. You know, they have money, they have buildings, they have these great facilities, um, but these churches are closing their doors at a faster pace than what smaller churches are. Um, and smaller churches are still closing their doors, but there's another thing that's happening at the same time. And I've talked about this over the course of the last year or two. Um, there's this uh, house church movement uh, where you have lay, lay ministers, people who are not trained at seminary, who are planting these churches. I have multiple friends um, who didn't go to, to, to school for ministry, um, they don't have Bible degrees, and they've planted some of what, it, what I would consider some of the most successful house churches um, that are incredibly healthy. Um, they're doing well, they're, they're, they're feeding people, they're clothing people, they're, they're taking care of people's needs. And because they meet in houses and because there's not a, a, a anybody, I was gonna say a paid minister, but there's not anybody who's on paid staff uh, they're able to take 100% of the funds that they receive and use 100% of those funds to help people in need. Um, there's a lot more flexibility because there's not a lot of church politicking that goes on. Um, they're able to make better and quicker decisions for how to use those funds and who to help and how to best serve people in their communities, their local communities. Um, and so that movement is really um, solidifying and I think we need to be aware of that, that, that this is happening and that, that a lot of Christians think that because there's this movement of churches closing their doors that, oh my goodness, like, you know, we're no longer a Christian na nation and the church is doomed and, you know, it's like all this doom and gloom stuff. And I'm like, no, 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 like, you don't understand how vast this movement is where people are planting house churches and the church, God's church at large, is very healthy and very strong. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm really encouraged by that. But I want to share with you guys uh, first some scriptures. We're going we're gonna to begin with scripture. And then we're going to talk about some things personally, um, how the kingdom is being affected through this body of believers. Um, and Dave and I have had a couple conversations this past week just about how neat it is that um, there are so many different people just from Christina being in the hospital. That's just one example of many. Um, but how many people's lives are being affected in a positive way through that? And how many people are praying for Christina who Christina doesn't even, she doesn't even realize it. She doesn't even know. And I had this conversation with Christina on Friday and she's like, I just can't believe how many people are reaching out to me who I don't, I never even knew they existed. She's like, I don't know these people. And she's like, and they're calling me up saying, I've been praying for you. My family's been praying for you. Um, so here's going back to the, the grit of just being a Christian and just grinding and working and not expecting 
this happy, you know, wonderful, pump me up worship service that's going to carry you through the rest of the week. Um, it's, it's, it's not about self-serving, it's about serving, right? Our, our walk, our Christian walk, our Christian faith is not about receiving things to pump us up. It's, it's about giving of ourselves to help other people. So here's what James says. James chapter 5, starting at verse 7. James says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. It's kind of a long time to wait, right? Like, James isn't naive. He's not, like, falsely telling people to wait around until the end of, you know, until the end of next week. Um, there's no illusion that Christ is coming back quickly. Um, we don't know when Christ is coming back. So basically, be patient forever. Uh, be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. That's our sermon today, is the mercy of God. God is merciful. Uh, but above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by uh, any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. And I think that's kind of like, at first it seems like that's really an out of context statement. Uh, but to me, it makes perfect sense. If you really think about it, um, I think what James is saying is like, don't give all these empty promises. Don't puff people up and tell them, you know, I'm going to promise you this. And uh, don't talk out of both sides of your mouth. Uh, just go out, be patient, and serve other people. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Um, and I think a lot of times we get caught up in all these different things that are going on. Like life, you know, life itself kind of can kick our rear ends. Um, we get caught up in our own little world. We get caught up in our own little families. Uh, we get caught up in all these different things. Um, and then in, in, in church work, uh, you know, we, we can get caught up in arguments. We can get caught up in all kinds of different things. And James is just saying, look, um, be patient, serve other people, let your yes be yes, let your no be no. If you can help people, help people. If you can't, you can't. Um, you know, uh, let your yes be yes, let your no be no. Uh, don't give empty promises to people. Uh, then he goes on. He says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call uh, for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has, uh, has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. <clears throat> and for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. His prayer was a little too potent, I think. Uh, then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you uh, wonders from the truth, and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Um, whoops, sorry. Me and Dave were fighting with the... Uh, we we're fighting for control. Uh, so if, if you listen to what he's saying is important, um, it's this taking care of each other, uh, taking care of people's spiritual needs, taking care of people's physical needs, um, not so much focusing on, on what you can get out of it, but finding people who are in need. If somebody's sick, uh, pray. Pray. Pray over those people. Uh, if somebody's happy, then let them rejoice. Um, Acts chapter 2. Uh, <clears throat> can we hide that little bar? 
Well, let me do that. There we go. <clears throat> now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Oh, no, sorry. I'm starting in 42. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and they, um, the Christians, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. Listen to where their devotion is. Their devotion is not caught up in, like, all these programs of the church and, all, you know, like, all the things that, that, that we get caught up in, all these little rabbit trails. Um, their devotion is to the scriptures, the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayers. That's it. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending to the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are, who are being saved. And I think the importance of this is something happens when you get into the lives of other people and you just serve them. Something happens. Something God-like happens. And you start seeing these ripple effects that Kind of, kind of take your breath away, and they blow your mind, and you're like, I never saw this coming, you know? Like, this is, this is an outcome that I never saw coming. Um, and I'm going to give examples of that again after we read these scriptures of, of what I see happening uh, through this body of believers. Then you want to skip to the, um, uh, the last in Acts chapter 4. Starting in verse 32, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as, uh, as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And so it's this nurturing and caring for people, um, not calling your possessions your possessions. Uh, it's not this individualistic, possessive, um, look how hard I've worked for, for my things, you know? And like, we kind of live in a culture where we show off we showboat the things that we work hard for. We display the things that, that are mine. I worked, I worked, and, and I built this house with my own two hands, and I, you know, and, and we become possessive of our things. What were you going to say, Wendy? I think that we should give our things to other people. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Because it's not about you. It's about them. You know, maybe not give them away, Completely, but, but certainly share, right? Uh, we should be willing to share. Um, we should be willing to share our things with other people. Um, we should be well, willing to, to sell things in our abundance uh, to help people who don't have. Um, I, I, I've heard plenty of stories and, and know of plenty of examples of Christians uh, who've sold possessions quietly, uh, just things that were for recreation, um, boats, um, planes, cars, you know, like things that they had around that they didn't really need. Um, and they were convicted and were like, you know what, there, there are other people in need and I'm going to take the money from this and I'm going to bless other people. Uh, I certainly don't think the scripture saying sell everything and become homeless and take your family and live out on the, you know, out on the street and be exposed to the weather. and like I don't think for a second that that's what the Scripture is telling us to do. Uh, because there are plenty of Scriptures that talk about being responsible, taking care of your family, providing for your family. Uh, we need to be providers. We need to take care of our family and take care of them well. Um, but it's this position of blessing other people and seeing what God does with that. 
And so I want to I want to share with you um, some things. Uh, this just came to me yesterday. Uh, my sister Steph texted me and sent me these pictures, and um, this is a house that's being built uh, for Jessela, who worked for Steph and Ronnie. Uh, she was one of the housekeepers at, at the Hope House when they lived in Haiti uh, at COTP, and um, Natalie and the kids and I have been supporting her daughter, Nika, uh, for years now, and, um, and just for reference, um, we're talking like $20 a month, which doesn't seem like a lot to us at all. We're like $20 like is absolutely nothing. Um, and with that $20, it, it's paid for Nika's school. And I have pictures. I wish I would have put these up. But in 2019, which was the last time that we went to Haiti, um, Eden was only eight. And her and Nika, um, I have pictures of them together, and they were playing, playing together. And um, Nika's a little bit younger than Eden. Uh, but Jessela sends me pictures um, and, and updates and shows me like her, Nika's report card. And this girl's smart. Uh, and you know, in Haiti, they don't have free schooling. If, if, if you're educated, it's because somebody's paying for your education. Uh, and so they don't take it lightly, you know, and, and they have to buy their own uniforms. Um, everybody wears the same uniform in Haiti. Um, and Nika's taken her education very seriously. And, it, and it's just really cool. But we, we visited in their home in Haiti in 2019, and it, it was rough. Um, it, it was a rough neighborhood. Um, Jessela didn't feel safe. Uh, Oftentimes she had to leave Nika at home. Like she would, she would take a moto taxi and take it, you know, the hour ride into work. And she had to leave her little six-year-old daughter, uh, her only child. She would leave her behind and the neighbors would care for the daughter. Um, she didn't have a door that locked on the house. Um, she just had like a, a, a curtain. Um, and so anybody could walk right into the house. Um, it, it was not a good situation. It was not ideal. And so Steph sent me this yesterday, and she said, um, I just wanted you to know that Nika uh, built her house, and this is the house that she's been building. She's been tucking away a little bit of extra money that we've been given every month. She's been putting a little bit aside, and same with Steph and Ronnie. And she bought and paid for her own house, um, which is incredible. And so you see the brand new um, tin roof. Uh, and their houses are not fancy. And this is very small. You can see uh, what probably is the foundation of the house. Uh, not much bigger than the box that those two are in back there. Um, Jessela was proud of the door. And there you can see where the door goes into. And this is like a complex, this is like a, basically an apartment complex. And so hers is like this little tiny, probably two, 300 square foot. It'll be a concrete pad. Um, that's her home. And she's proud of it and she feels safe. And what was cool about this was that we never thought that by giving $20 a month, we were actually helping somebody tuck money away for the past you know, five, six years to build her own house where she can feel safe and protected. Um, and so God does all these really cool things through us. Um, I'm going to talk about Christina for, for a minute, too. Because uh, this is really cool. Uh, one day last week, I, I, get, a, I get a text uh, from somebody, and I won't mention names because it, it doesn't matter. Um, God knows who this person is. Um, she said, hey, we're in Pittsburgh, 
and I want to know what Christina's room number is. This lady's never met Christina before. Um, she said, my family's been praying for Christina, and we have some flowers that we want to hand deliver to her room. And um, she's like, I can't go up myself, but there, there's this young, you know, young woman who's part of our family. Um, I think she's like 20 years old. She said, she, I'm going to send her up to Christina's room and hand deliver the flowers. And so I talked to Christina, and I said, hey, I heard you, I heard you had somebody uh, stop in and deliver flowers today. And she just starts crying on the phone, and she's like, Jimmy, that was my angel. She's like, she was the sweetest girl, and she came in here, she handed me the flowers, and she said, I just, I just wanted to hug you. She's like, that hug meant the world, that, it meant the world to me and was from a total stranger. She's like, I never knew that so many people cared about me. Now, I never knew that so many people were praying for me. And Dave and I talked about this. They're like, Dave's stepmom is praying. Uh, she'd been praying for Christina very faithfully. Uh, and what's neat is when we ask people to pray, they ask people to pray. And then they ask people to pray. And then they ask people to pray. And so um, I want to read a, a, a text message that I got last night. Huh, I missed call from DP. <laughs> Oh, you sinners. So I want, to read, um, I want to read this message from Valinda. It's 9 o'clock last night. And Valinda's watching online, so sorry, Valinda, if you didn't want me to read this, but I think you'll be good with it. Uh, 9 o'clock last night. She says, good evening. Sorry to bother you. I just wanted you to be aware that I will be baptizing someone tonight. I'm getting Charles's key. Her name is Alyssa. She's actually Christina's neighbor. Christina has been working with her for years, and she called me and wants to be baptized. Um, and then she goes on. She says she wanted to come to services today. Um, Eden and I actually went to pick her up, and then there was like... Uh, a little overlap and we kind of missed each other. But, um, but Alyssa sent me a super nice message this morning and just said, um, I, I will be there next week. She apologized um, for the miscommunication. But uh, isn't that neat? And this is happening not because we're this wonderful, magnificent church that's packed full of people and has this magnificent facility and has these worship services that are just, you know, hill, hill, hill song quality, like the professional musicians and the lights and all that stuff. This isn't happening because of that. These things are happening because of grit. Because people, through their exhaustion, <laughs> um, through the hustle and bustle of everyday normal life, are simply reaching out to people and blessing them and helping them. Uh, Christina has quietly been uh, helping all of her neighbors. And that whole, everybody knows Christina. When you go to 800 East Main, everybody knows Christina. Um, she, she faithfully helps people, spends time with people, opens up her Bible and reads it with people. And she goes in the hospital, and I think probably in our, in our smaller expectation part of our brain, we're like, oh, well, we're going to pray for Christina, and she's going to physically get well and, you know, uh, and get to come home. But the bigger picture is she's affecting a lot of people for the kingdom. And it goes back to what James said, be patient. Be patient in your sufferings. Uh, you don't know the big picture. You don't know what God is doing in you and through you. And when we, uh, when we ask people to pray, um, God is working. And God is building his kingdom. And so we're seeing this, 
this type of movement and these types of things, and I, like we mentioned Julian in Haiti all the time too, like God is doing incredible things through that man because of you people. We are his only financial support, period. Period. He has no other financial support coming from either within his country or outside of it. And through that one man, so many lives have been spared. So many people have come to Christ. Um, he sends me updates all the time of people being baptized like crazy um, because in his poverty, he just opens up his Bible and sits with people. And he teaches them about Christ and the love of God. It's grit that's making the kingdom grow. It's people loving God, loving their neighbor, and serving others. That's what's making the church strong. That's what's making the church grow. Not just, not just in this country. This isn't just happening here. This is happening all over the world. And so this idea that the church is dead, that the church is weak, that all these churches are closing their doors, and so you know, we're not a Christian nation, and... Um, people are godless and nobody wants anything to do with God in this country and our culture, you know, with all the culture wars that are going on, like it's ruined people and it's such a terrible country to raise your kids in. Like all this stuff that we hear is utter nonsense. It's utter nonsense. God is God and God is the same God he was since the beginning of time. God is the same God now, and God will be the same God in 10,000 years from now. So I just wanted to encourage you guys with that message and, and let you know um, so many lives are being affected. And by the way, um, I forgot to mention this. This is pretty cool. Uh, so this family who I said uh, about bringing flowers into Christina's room, um, I also got a message from the mom and, and said, uh, two of my daughters right now are asking me about baptism. Can you come to the house and can you sit down and can we all just open up our Bibles and talk about baptism? I was like, I think I can arrange that. God is impacting lives through you guys even when you don't know it. And so serving other people it's not just about dropping food off and, you know, and, and helping people like right now in their immediate needs. It's about God working in you and through you uh, to bless other people and to lead people to Christ. And that's what we see when we read these scriptures. That's what the church did. Uh, they took care of each other's needs. They, you know, daily they met together in each other's homes. They, they broke bread together. Um, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. God was doing that work. They were simply helping people out, opening up the scriptures, talking, and God did the rest. Uh, I'm encouraged for, um, for what's happening in the church um, at large. Uh, I'm encouraged at what's happening in and through this congregation. And uh, I just think God has um, a lot more up his sleeves. We'll put it that way. We're out of time. Um, thank you guys and um, enjoy your fellowship time together for the next um, 18 minutes or so. And then we'll see you in a little bit. Thanks, everyone.